Hello and welcome to Subtypes in Conversation with Grant Stevens as part of this year's Melbourne Art Fair. My name is Nina Mile. I'm the Curator of International Art here in Brisbane at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. And I'm also the Curator of the Video Sector for this year's Melbourne Art Fair. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Turabal and Yagara people. Um, and today I'm really delighted to be joined by Grant Stevens, a fantastic artist uh, who I've had the great pleasure of working with on a couple of occasions, most recently at uh, last year's Tarawara Biennial. Um, Grant is an Australian artist based in Sydney. He has exhibited widely nationally and internationally. Uh, he works predominantly with computer graphics, moving image and photography. And uh, he's also currently kind of deputy head of school at UNSW Art and Design. And he is represented by Sullivan and Strumpf in Sydney and Stark White at Auckland, uh, both of whom I imagine can be found at the fair. Welcome Grant. Thanks Nina. And um, yeah, thanks for your work on the, the video section of the fair. And I also wanna thank the, the Melbourne Art Fair and Subtype for their support. Um, I'm in Bondi, so I also want to acknowledge that this is really beautiful Bidjigal and Gadigal land and, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Grace. So Grant, you're showing two computer generated moving image works, which imagine these incredibly richly detailed environments. Um, the Forest is the work at the Melbourne Art Fair and Fawn in the Forest, a related work is at the subtype Melbourne store. Um, can you start by telling us a bit more about uh, the work at the Melbourne Art Fair, The Forest? Yeah, so uh, The Forest is a work from, from 2020 um, and it's a computer generated um, alpine forest scene. Um, and uh, there's a, a camera that's programmed with artificial intelligence that, that kind of roams through the forest and picks out different viewpoints and different perspectives. So yeah, it's an artwork that runs in real time um, it's this kind of idealized alpine forest. Um, and what you see each time that the, the artwork runs will be different depending on where the camera goes and, and what it picks out. So yeah, with this work, I was really looking to create something that was um, quite calm and peaceful and slow, but also have a sense of something being uneasy or uns unsettling about it. Um, and, and I guess for me, part of the background there is about thinking about the ways that algorithms um, and artificial intelligence, um, you know, impacts a lot of what we see on screens now, particularly, you know, through social media algorithms and, and so on. So that was, I guess, part of the conceptual background for that work. Yeah, great. It's, it's such a beautiful and quite kind of hypnotic, mesmerizing work. Um, and so Fawn in the Forest, that is kind of related to this body of work, but different. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Fawn in the Forest, I made um, directly after the forest and um, I was really lucky enough to be um, commissioned by Buxton Contemporary in, in 2020 to create uh, a dig another digital artwork and they, they were looking for something that could um, be online as well as be in the physical gallery. And when Buxton commissioned me to make this work, it was um, during uh, the Melbourne lockdown, one of many lockdowns in Melbourne, um, during, you know, that kind of um, winter of 2020. So I was, I was thinking about, you know, different responses to the pandemic and to these um, circumstances of being locked down. So yeah, in this work, it's a, it's a redwood forest, another kind of idealized forest environment. And there's a juvenile fawn, um, a baby fawn that wanders the forest, it eats, it sits down, it walks around, it doesn't really do much. Uh, and there's a there's an AI camera that follows the fawn through the forest. So yeah, for me, what I was thinking about with this work was, um, you know, how to reflect this condition of being isolated, being alone, but also safe. And so the 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 deer became this um, kind of symbol of that for me. And and in this artwork, again, I wanted to make something that was quite calm and peaceful. But again, yeah, something that you know there is a there's an emotional resonance there, hopefully. Yeah, interesting. And so um, you talked about the fawn. What, what kind of visual languages and technologies did you draw on for these works? I mean, you mentioned a fawn in the forest and obviously Bambi immediately comes to mind. Um, but I'm sure there was a range of, of kind of cultural references 
and um, and also technologies that you drew upon. Yeah, so the, these artworks, I'm, I'm using a um, 3D gaming engine. So this is software that's often used to create video games. Um, and part of the process in developing them is, is looking at existing, um, they're called assets, digital assets that you can use um, in your games or in your artworks, the projects that you develop. So part of it is adopting that or responding to that visual language. And for me, it's quite interesting that a lot of the, the assets that are available reflect this kind of European uh, American centric visual culture. And that's something that's been a theme um, throughout my practice for a long time is, is responding to the uh, visual language of, of popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Fawn in the Forest Bambi is, is an obvious reference point and the, there's a few other reference points there. But for me, yeah, really interested in, in the kind of symbolic potency of um, the natural environment and um, but also deliberately working with these kind of cliches and, and conventions of, of visual culture. Yeah. And, um, and so what was the process? Can you kind of talk us through how you began to build these environments? Because there's, you know, there's incredible rich detail in them. And um, so you, can you, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about how you approached that? What was the process? Yeah, so um, I guess each work evolves slightly differently and, and some parts of it are quite fast. Um, actually, kind of creating the terrain um, can be quite a quick process, but there's just infinite level of detail that you can go to. So, um, you know, there's lots of kind of tweaking and lots of working through those things. Um, you know, but there's, a, there's kind of like the front end, what you see on screen, but there's also a back end, the kind of programming um, that that goes into the artworks, and that's probably the bit that takes the longest is is working on those um, particular settings and the different kind of coding that goes into the artworks. So yeah, there's there's always that kind of front end and back end, and and um, yeah, working through the kind of the infinite level of detail that you can go to. I can only imagine it, it must take a properly kind of obsessive mind to uh, to really drill down into that that detail. Um, you mentioned these computer generated terrains operate in real time, sort of kind of unfolding in unpredictable ways determined by the algorithms that are embedded in the works. Can you talk a little bit about why you were drawn to working with this medium and how time operates in these works? Yeah, so yeah, I've been working with moving image for quite a while in my practice since I kind of started in the early 2000s. And um, you know, initially working with video editing software, but always with computer graphics, pretty much. So, um, I guess in the in the last, I, why I'm drawn to moving images partly about you know this being able to work with time as as part of the medium. And the last few years, maybe four or five years ago, really started to want to make artworks that were um, long and and slow and durational, um, and started to have some kind of frustration with with video editing editing software that you have to always have a start and finish and mm -hmm. and like lots of artists you're trying to create this kind of um, seamless loop in in the works mm -hmm. so I started to think at that time you know there must be another way to work with time a different kind of um, medium that I could use to um, you know create artworks that that don't have a start and finish mm -hmm. and that can evolve kind of organically over time and so that's what drew me to these gaming engine um, software and, and working in that way. And yeah, for me, you know, I think a lot about, um, you know, today in visual culture, um, time is such an important thing, you know, so we live in this age where uh, instant gratification is, is predominant and there's so many things competing for our attention. So as an artist, you know, how do you respond? Do you, do you make artworks that, um, compete in that environment or try to create something that, um, you know, maybe, maybe works against it or in a, in a different kind of um, time scale. So, yeah, for me, deliberately trying to make artworks that are, that are slow, um, maybe boring for some, um, but, yeah, trying to, trying to work with yeah, different time scales and different kind of temporal rhythms in the artworks. Yeah, beautiful. And you get that kind of very slow pan of the camera that slowly roams this, this terrain kind of endlessly. Um, 
So there's obviously a huge amount of kind of thought and time and effort put into developing the graphics for these works. But I know from having worked with you in the past that you also think very carefully about the sound or the scores. Um, and for these two particular works, you know, there's this quite orchestral score um, that are particularly intriguing because there's something sort of uncanny or unsettling and at times discordant about them. Um, they seem to kind of build or swell to a climax that never really eventuates. And um, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about why you were looking to this sort of music and what you hope to achieve by using it. Yeah, so the, the soundtracks for both works are also um, unfolding in real time. So every time you see the work or listen to the work, it will, it will be different. I mean, it always sounds similar, um, uh, which is part of the kind of idea of those works, but they're always evolving and changing. So. Uh, I guess the way that it works is that there's a, a range of um, samples that are in the background and, and the algorithm, the, the program is choosing different um, instruments and different chords and then kind of layering them together. Um, and then there's a, a whole range of kind of variables that go into it as well. So the effect that I'm looking for in, in those soundtracks is to have this sense of, I guess, hinting towards a narrative that, that mm -hmm. something is happening or about to happen, but that there is never that climax. Um, you know, there's never a moment where there's a you know massive crescendo where you get that kind of um, yeah sense of of a narrative resolving. So really, what yeah, in these artworks, really want that sound to contribute to a sense of um, this slow build that never kind of eventuates. That it's always um, unfolding and and always kind of leading us somewhere. Yeah, there's that sense of sort of delayed or deferred gratification rather than the instant gratification that you were speaking about earlier. Um, but unlike the works, this talk has been very gratifying. <laughs> so thank you so much, Grant. And if you can, please take um, the amazing opportunity to see both of Grant's works, uh, The Forest at the Melbourne Art Fair and Fawn in the Forest at Subtypes uh, Melbourne store. And thank you very much for joining me.